Welcome everybody, we'll get started in a few minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Let's give everyone a couple of minutes to join and then we can get started. Thanks for being here today. Hello everyone. Thank you once again for joining the Our Warming Planet Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation webinar series. This is our 13th bi-weekly webinar, which uh, started with the book launch in February. So thank you everyone for sticking with us since February. Um, all our webinars have been special, but this one unintentionally became scheduled during climate week. So it makes it a little extra special. And um, it's uh, wonderful to have you uh, join us, especially this Wednesday. I want to announce that um, as all good things, this webinar series will conclude uh, and the final date is November 2nd for the grand finale. So we do, um, we would like as many of you to join that as possible. So I am going to um, put the registration link uh, so we just have a few more coming up. So this is where you can register. Uh, I know some of you have registered for multiple, but the November 2nd date was just added. So please sign up for that. And um, let's get started with, uh, with the agenda. Over to you, Jen, thank you. So today we have the pleasure of uh, having Irene Amaron joining us and she will be talking to us about using climate science to prepare for disasters uh, and it will be focused on early warning, early action and forecast based financing. Um, it's there are so many disasters happening uh, currently as well so you know as always this is a very relevant uh, re very relevant chap uh, chapter from the book and also a lecture. Uh, so once we finish with the introduction and Irene's lecture, we also have uh, an additional discussion today. It will be a discussion moderated by Andrew Krukskiewicz from IRI Columbia University, who also collaborates with the Red Cross Climate Center. So he'll have his own insights and will also moderate the discussion. Then we have Jen Evans uh, moderating a live Q&A session. So any specific questions you have on the lecture or the discussion, you can send us uh, these questions anytime through the Q&A part of this webinar. And uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And then uh, we will have a short write up and also announce what lectures are coming up. Next slide, please. Let me begin by introducing the editors of Our Warming Planet. This book has multiple, it has 25 chapters and lots of fantastic authors. And um, this book is really um, in honor of Martin Parry. So Martin Parry 
He's a pioneer in climate impacts and played a key role in the 2007 IPCC reports. Martin is a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College in London. He was co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2, which focused on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and has been a convening lead author of three IPCC assessments. He has been a professor of geography at the University of Oxford, University College London, East Anglia and Birmingham in the UK. Then we have Cynthia Rosenzweig, who is a senior research scientist at Columbia University Center for Climate Systems Research and at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, where she heads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model into Comparison and Improvement Project, AGMIP. She was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments. Cynthia was named one of nature's 10 people who mattered in 2012, and she's a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. In May 2022, just a few months ago, Cynthia was awarded the World Food Prize. It also gives me great pleasure to introduce David Rind. On to the next slide, please, Jen. David is a senior NASA research emeritus at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. For more than 30 years, he has been a climate research scientist for NASA, as well as an adjunct professor at Columbia University, teaching graduate level courses in climate dynamics and atmospheric dynamics. He has more than 300 publications relating to climate and climate change and is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. He's a recipient of many awards, including being a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize as a lead author on the IPCC. On to the next slide. Oh, actually, let's leave this slide and Jen, uh, Thank you, Jen. And over to you, David, to talk a little bit about the book series. And then uh, when you're ready, Jen will turn over to the next slide where you can introduce some of the chapters in this book as well. Over to you, David. So uh, as many of you know, these webinars are given in conjunction with uh, several different books, all on the uh, general topic of our warming planet. Associated with the, the current lectures is the book, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. And as, as uh, Manishka mentioned, there are about 25 different lectures in the book. Each one consists of about five pages of a detailed discussion of the lecture in association with 20 uh, effectively PowerPoint slides. Uh, for those who order the book, these slides are available online and can be downloaded and used in classes and talks for both teachers, students, and the general public. So what these webinars do is give added value to those things by hearing actually the lectures from the voice of the people who prepared them using many of the same slides. So uh, this is the, uh, in, in this particular book, uh, Climate Change Adaptation, Impacts and Adaptation, um, you see the various chapters in the various sections. Uh, right now, Irene's talk uh, is um, listed and um, with respect to uh, early warning and how people will react to it, to climate disasters. Uh, this, the seminar series has been going on for several months, again, as many of you know, and many of the chapters have already been covered, but they are all available online still for those who have missed them, uh, and Manishka can provide the uh, link for that. Uh, back to you, Jen, or Manishka. Thanks so much, David. So now we will uh, spend a few minutes getting to know all of you who have joined us today. So I'll run a couple of polls and uh, I encourage as many of you to participate in this. So our first question is, we are really trying to have global participation, which is a challenge of course, because of time zones and such, uh, but you know, we have had people joining us from all geographical regions in the past, but you know, 
it's a, it's a busy week. It's climate week. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so we've had about, we've had almost 70%, more than 70% of you have participated in this poll. So I'm just going to keep it open for a few more seconds to um, allow you to participate. Okay, we have 75%, almost 80% participation. So this is fantastic. I'm going to end the poll and um, share the results. So we have today uh, participants from Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean and North America. So that's pretty good, but um, you know, we, Oceania, unfortunately, it's uh, bedtime for them. But uh, Irene, we, let's talk about how we can uh, target more uh, participants from Africa. Then we have, uh, we, we would love to know which sector you work in. Believe it or not, we've had uh, in many of our past webinars, we've actually had participation from all sectors, which has been very, very exciting. Um, it's really quite impressive, um, you know, the number of sectors that get represented in these webinars. So, Please participate in this poll. We have about 70% that have participated so far. And it's climbing up. Let's just give it a few more seconds. And okay, so we have almost 80%. Let me share the results. So once again, we uh, have all sectors represented, which is fantastic. This is great. And then the final question is, we would love to know your involvement in climate change work. And once again, um, similar to past webinars, we've had a range uh, from people who work directly in climate change to people who just wanna learn more about climate change. So this is really the objective is to reach as many of you as possible. We have almost 70% of you uh, that have polled. Let's give it a few more seconds, get a few more participants. Fantastic. Okay, we have almost 80% of you that participated. Let's see the results. Once again, we have, um, you know, people working in climate change, some who want to learn more about it. So, um, you know, this is hopefully the right place for all of you to learn a little bit more about today's topic. So I'm gonna stop sharing the poll results. And we would also love to know more about all of you um, on a more individual basis as well. So please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, you know, you can use the chat function for this. You can share as much or as little information as you like. You can maybe mention your name, your country, institution, role, email, how you think this book might be helpful. Um, just as much or as little information as you like. Great, so while you start introducing yourselves, over to the next slide, Jen. Wonderful. Today, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Irene Amoron. Irene is the technical advisor on forecast-based financing at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, supporting the Red Cross movement and its partners in Africa to set up anticipatory systems. Irene leads on anticipatory action and is a focal person for learning, innovation, and exchange at the Anticipation Hub. She's a technical expert in the field of disaster risk management, whose expertise includes specialist support to national societies and its partners on forecast-based financing. Her research interests include impact-based financing, early action, early warning, forecast-based financing, and flood forecasting for humanitarian action. Really looking forward to, to your lecture, Irene. Over to you. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much, uh, Manishka, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you are. And uh, yes, I will take us through, just give me a minute to share my uh, screen. Let me know, Manishka, if you can see my screen. I do, yes, this, this okay. looks great. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. So again, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, on sharing what we are doing as part of our responses towards the changing climate. And maybe before I start uh, uh, my lecture, I would just like to get a feel of the temperature in the room. And I'll ask um, everybody to type in the chat in terms of, um, I know when you go to the chat, there are different, either you could use an emoji or you could just use one word to describe how you are this morning, this afternoon, this evening, you know, are you happy? Are you tired? Are you sad? Are you, you know? Yes, so that I also get to know whether I should, uh, you know, conclude the lecture within five minutes or go through up to the allocated time. So, and also this gives me an opportunity to know that while it is a virtual space, but I'm also not alone in the room. So I would kindly ask your engagement, dear colleagues and participants, yes, just drop in the chat. How are you feeling today? Are you happy? Are you tired? Are you sad? Are you, you know, are you just lost? So that, you know, we get to know who is in the room. For myself, I am actually happy, happy, excited to be able to join you in this room. So Manishka, how are the responses coming along? Everyone seems to be really happy, so I think we want you to do your 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. Thank yes. you so much. And yes, where there are happy faces, that is positive energy. And if you're not yet happy, I hope that by the end of uh, this session, by the end of today, you will be happy. So I would like to talk about early warning and early action. And uh, my first uh, dive into this lecture is just to kind of get all of us uh, on the same page in terms of what do we mean by early warning and uh, early action. I mean, different organizations, different entities have uh, different uh, terminologies that they use. So broadly, I will go with uh, the definition that we use within the Red Cross, um, Red Crescent uh, movement. And so we are saying, we are defining our early warning and early action as taking humanitarian action before a disaster or health emergency happens, making full use of scientific, local, and risk information on all timescales. And on the, on the right, uh, it's also saying using available climate and weather information to take action. So the key word here is about taking action before a disaster strikes in order to be able to reduce the negative impacts. So we are looking at early action as one, we want to take action before, the, so our parameters for early action is the timing element, that is uh, the before. And then uh, what is the aim of our early action? We would want to make sure that we either prevent or mitigate the impacts of the anticipated event. And then of course the third one uh, is what are we using to be able to activate our, our actions what predictions are we using? It could be uh, weather forecast, it could be predictive anal analytics. Basically, it is uh, what methodology would be able to activate your early actions. So those are the three parameters that we use to be able to define our early action. So as uh, David had already introduced, yes, uh, the webinars around you know, uh, climate change and the impacts. And I believe most of us are pretty um, much aware. And I'm also happy that uh, the poll that Manishka took said 39% of our participants in the room are actually involved in climate change. So that makes my intro quite a little bit easy. But uh, for others who are not familiar, uh, the IPCC report, the latest having been uh, published uh, this, uh, this year in February, and all of it is pointing towards, you know, um, um, a situation or a scenario where we're saying our changing climate is causing, is leading to uh, changes in the frequency, intensity, uh, extent, duration, and timing of extreme events. Um, all over the world. So even 
even uh, regions that were not, for example, experiencing some of these hazards are beginning to experience them. Uh, for example, in, um, in, in, in Uganda, you know, usually we have quite a cool climate, but the nights have been uh, hotter than, than, than usual, you know. Uh, they are getting even longer than, than usual. So this is coming closer to, to home. Before, we, also, we only used to hear about a warming climate uh, in other countries, but now we are, we are beginning to, uh, to, to feel it. So we are going to expect more of these events happening. We are going to expect more of floods. We are going to expect more of drought, more of storms, cyclones, and all this. And they will be, they will increase in frequency on how often they happen, in the intensity, uh, the kind of magnitude and impact uh, in terms of the coverage of these events and also the duration. So the scientists are telling us all doesn't look so well, especially if we fold our arms and do nothing about it. So yes, in terms of the IPCC uh, findings, uh, it's very clear. This is uh, we are going to see more and more of those of these events. And if you haven't read these reports, I would, I would, I would urge you to go read them at least for at the very least read the summaries. It has some very very interesting uh, um, uh, reports. It has some very interesting information. And one of the things I liked about the recent IPCC uh, uh, publications is also the fact that you know it acknowledges the contribution of uh, human activity towards all this so yes we do have the changing climate and also you know we do have a, a contribution of the human uh, activities towards what we are experiencing what we are experiencing so with all this information you know we know that uh, our forecasting abilities have improved technology to be able to look into the future has grown all over the world, of course, not at the same level. It's better in places like Europe, in Africa, we still have a long way to go around forecasting. So we are saying that with this ability to be able to have a sneak peek into the future, you know, there is an opportunity for us to be able to, uh, to, do, to do something. So we are saying that, yes, with the, with, with the increasing changes in climate, uh, the pictures here that you see are examples of hazards that have been reported all over the world. You see the floods in Bosnia, and of course, currently, especially in West Africa, in the eastern part of Africa, we are experiencing flooding, flooding in Southern Af in South Sudan, flooding in, uh, uh, in Niger, flooding in, uh, in, uh, in Mali, in Ghana, in uh, Zambia, and sorry, not Zambia, in, uh, uh, in, in Nigeria and also Cambodia has reported flooding. So it's happening almost all over, all over the globe. You know, then the picture around for, uh, for drought, as also some of you are familiar, East Africa region, we are experiencing one of the unprecedented levels of food insecurity linked to, uh, linked to drought. So Somalia, uh, 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 Somalia is one of the countries that is adversely affected, Ethiopia. So we are going to see more of these kind of events, uh, the typhoons in, 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 uh, in Philippines, and of course the, um, uh, the heat waves as well as, well as uh, hurricanes. So all this to show that this is already happening closer to home. And I think also last year, if my memory serves me right, uh, with some of the publications of this report, the UN Secretary General uh, declared that actually we are on planet red if we do not do something. And so with this recognition and awareness of the potential impacts that we are already experiencing and what is expected to uh, appear, this calls, for, uh, uh, this calls for action. And so we are trying to say that can, uh, we are trying to demonstrate that with early warning and early action, we are able to mitigate or even at the very least prevent some of these impacts that are associated with extreme climate and weather events. Again, uh, the slide that you see here is also a summary in terms of the climate change hotspots um, all over the world. So of course, uh, with related to the level of global, global warming. So we are already saying that even below the 1.5 degrees uh, um, increase in temperature for tropical areas, we're already seeing heat waves of up to two months. And yet, if this, if this temperature increases between 1.5 to 2 degrees, we are going to see this increasing to three months. And there is a high confidence that this is most likely to happen. And beyond the two degrees, it is very likely that the harsh temperatures and heat waves will directly affect our health, mortality, and productivity. So also, we will see the impact on agriculture. Uh, uh, for example, that we will see a reduction in the crop yields, particularly for maize, if the temperatures go beyond uh, two, uh, uh, two degrees, we will substantially see a reduction in the yield of, uh, of, of grain. In Southeast Asia, you will see again above uh, two degrees, substantial increases in, in, in uh, risk related to flooding from the sea level rise. 
And uh, when you run to West Africa, you'll see a reduction again in, 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 in maize uh, production. You'll see negative impacts on uh, grain, sorghum, and uh, and and, and uh, sorghum production. And then, of course, also within the major uh, food producing countries, we will also see this impact. Already we are seeing some of this uh, happening, as I believe some uh, you've seen reports of emergency responses. The UN has recently activated some funding for uh, uh, some of the countries in West Africa for, for drought. So we are already living with this impact. It's not about tomorrow. It is actually happening today. So all this provides a, a, a ground for us to be able to take action because we have the information. And so it is also a prerogative upon us to act upon that information. And that's why we are saying early warning and early action, you know, we should be able to do something about it. And uh, within the Red Cross, uh, one of the most memorable uh, records that we have around uh, implementing early warning and early actions was actually in West Africa in the 2007 uh, floods. For those of you who may still remember that, that the seasonal uh, seasonal outlook for uh, the, the region indicated a very high probability of flooding happening in the region and, uh, and sweeping across over 20 African countries. So what happened was that uh, the Red Cross, uh, the, uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross within the West Africa region, actually activated some funding for some preparedness activities to be able to uh, prepare for these anticipated impacts of flooding. So for example, in, uh, in, in Ghana, uh, because of this kind of, uh, because of this kind of uh, 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 early warning information, uh, the Ghana Red Cross had uh, drafted or developed agreements with the dam operators in the Bagre Dam to be able to have a chain of communication in terms of when the waters would be released. In Togo also similar actions were taken in, uh, in, in, in Gambia as, 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 um, as well. So institutionally, the Red Cross tried to preposition itself to be able to respond uh, once these uh, uh, impacts uh, were, were felt. And a post, uh, uh, post emergency evaluation was done after the season. Of course, a flooding happened, and a post emergency as assessment was done, and it in indicated that there was 33 percent um, reduction in terms of the cost per beneficiary compared to the previous uh, re emergency responses in the previous years, 2005 and 2006. So this kind of provided a platform to be able to. Um, uh, uh, popularize or push for a shift from reaction uh, to proactive disaster risk um, management, and so um, this is this 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 um, this is these are some of the justifications of why we are saying why do we then have to move towards early warning and and early action. So with that experience that we got from the 2007 floods in West Africa, there was there was more there was more ground that was laid down in terms of why we should transition towards early warning and early action. So with the weather forecasting, of course, we're able to anticipate, reduce, and prepare for the changing risks. This was in particular to the, uh, to the floods. And then also with such information, uh, the early warning information, the Red Cross was able to request for funding. Ideally, um, most of the, uh, uh, the funding that comes from emergency response within the Red Cross then was based on impact assessment. So there has to be damage. There has to be... Uh, um, uh, damage for you to be able to uh, request for funding. But with this uh, seasonal forecast, the IFRC was able to release funding for national societies to preposition items for national societies to, you know, to, to, to broker partnerships and relationships with relevant stakeholders, such as the, the dam operators. And then also, you know, preposition uh, or activate community structures that would be able to relate early warning and early and early action. And post evaluation, of course, it indicated there were some gains around uh, taking actions early and around uh, financial gains. And then also taking early action can help protect developmental uh, developmental gains because if you look at the DRM um, uh, uh, cycle, you know, where we are looking at preparedness, uh, emergency response, uh, rehabilitation across that cyclic, uh, uh, um, uh, across the cyclic uh, uh, framework, we find that if we take early actions, we are actually able to be able to uh, uh, to be able to preserve developmental developmental gains. So, for example, if people um, if 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 people uh, 
uh, set up river banks, okay? So when, with river banks, you're able to maybe channel water towards a certain area and therefore protect houses from being destroyed or therefore, you know, protect if people are able to relocate their animals, which are their source of livelihoods. And so you see that you're able to still maintain a sense of uh, functionality within a society, which can also contribute to development. So a case for early warning and early actions has been made. We continue to make a case for it. And so uh, with all this evidence, we think it is the way it is the way to go. These are all statistics that are drawn from the World Disaster Reports that talk about the impact of weather and uh, um, climate related uh, hazards. And according to, this, uh, uh, to these statistics, uh, it was indicated that 84% of the, of, of the weather related hazards sorry, 84% of the hazards that were recorded within the period of uh, 10 years in the MDAT uh, statistics uh, source indicated that uh, they are weather related. And then 95% of the people estimated to have been affected uh, in the last 10 years were affected by weather and climate dis uh, um, disasters. And 73% uh, of the losses incurred were due to weather and climate disasters. So this brings back the attention to the impact of the changing climate in our countries, in our communities, and what we need to do about it. So we can take action to ensure that these numbers actually don't continue shooting up. And so when you're thinking about um, early warning and, and uh, early action, uh, we would like to ensure that we are able, for example, to understand, you know, who should be a part of the early warning decision making and action taking, what kind of information is relevant, what action should we take, what kind of triggers, for example, do we need, when uh, will we take these early actions, and who is responsible for taking these actions. Of course, all these questions are crafted within the, uh, within the four elements of, um, of, of uh, early warning and, and uh, early, uh, within the four elements of an early warning the systems. But increasingly, we recognize that um, even with available early warning information, action is not necessarily taken. You know, there is always a gap. There is a mismatch between the information that is available and the inability to take early uh, and, and the inability to take early warning, uh, to take early actions. And so we would like to push for more engagement on the action side. The early warning systems are there, but some of them are, uh, are not as functional as they could be. And maybe I'd like to take um, I'd like to take a moment here and ask your thoughts around um, why do you think early action is not always taken in spite of early warning being available? If we could just put that in the chat, we do have early warning systems. Okay, we do have flood early warning systems. We do have heat early warning systems. Bangladesh has one of uh, you know the the the, the cyclone uh, uh, preparedness programs that have a cyclone warning systems. Why is action not always taken? Why is the level of action onto this early warning system? Why doesn't it match the 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 the, the expectation that we would like to see? Manishka, are there any questions coming? Come, yes, are there, there are a few. Yes, yes. You just, yes, of course. You just, yes. So yes, we please. have misinformation as one, yes. lack of money, inertia, distrust, cost liability, government bureaucracy, implementation is costly. So we've got some interesting answers so far. Exactly. So that is a nice segue into my introduction of uh, forecast-based financing. So we do recognize their early warning systems, but they are not functional. There are reasons people don't take actions. And you've mentioned some of them, you know, costs, misinformation, uh, uh, misinformation mistrust. People may not actually know what, um, uh, what to do. And this is where then we come in with the approach of forecast-based financing or if you would like to call it anticipatory action, because that seems to be lately the, the, the buzzword that is, uh, that is making uh, rounds around. So focus-based uh, focus financing or focus-based uh, action. And so within the Red Cross Red uh, uh, Crescent, we've been implementing this approach since 2013, built on the experiences of the 2007 floods in uh, West Africa. And so focus-based financing is an approach that enables access to funding for early action based on a credible forecast and an in-depth risk analysis. 
And so we are saying on one hand, you have the forecast, on the other, on another hand, you have a, a, a risk analysis, okay? So when you analyze, when you critically analyze uh, this, then you're able to take your early actions uh, based on the impacts that you'd like to, uh, to, 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 to address. So our key components of uh, focus-based financing approach, um, three, we have the triggers, we have the actions, and then we have the financing mechanisms. So the triggers, what do you mean by our triggers? So we, our triggers mean that this is the focus alert that indicates we have exceeded our probability or the thresholds that we had set uh, on uh, uh, within within the within the focus to be able to tell us when to act. So, for example, our our triggers are kind of if you look at the if if you use the analogy of the traffic lights. So, our triggers is what would tell you you know it is time to start taking action. It indicates that you've reached your probability of when uh, of of of, uh, of, of um, reaching. Uh, you've reached the probability, you've exceeded your probability uh, that you had set to be able to take action. It tells you it is now time, uh, it is now time to act. Say, for example, in, um, in Uganda, they set their, uh, they, they, they set their triggers uh, based on, of course, the, the focus, uh, um, the focus as well as um, an in-depth analysis on the risks and uh, integrating the vulnerability and exposure. So they identified that for floods, there are three impacts that we would like to address. The first one is of course, uh, uh, death, or yeah, we would like to minimize uh, uh, injury to people or, uh, or death. Then the second one is they would like to uh, minimize disease um, out, uh, outbreak. And then the third one is they would like to uh, uh, they would like to address the collapse of houses because those are the main impacts that are usually felt through flooding. So the triggers that they were set, they looked at what indicators under uh, under uh, exposure and vulnerability indicators would want to look at. So they looked at poverty. Of course, poor people are not able to build stronger houses. Poor people are not able to afford medic uh, to afford medical care. Then also they looked at um, the age groups. So 60 years and above, people are not, uh, usually the elderly here, are not able to take care of themselves. They looked at children under, um, uh, under five. So they analyzed these exposure indicators and the exposure and vulnerability indicators in terms of exposure, people who are settled along the river banks. And so they looked at also the weather forecast. So because we do not have a national flood forecasting model, we ended up using the flood uh, uh, global flood awareness uh, uh, system, the GLOFAS, to be able to provide us indications of what uh, our triggers would be. So they set a 60% uh, probability of, fl of, uh, 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 of flooding occurring in a, particular, um, in a particular area. And so when the focus indicates that that probability has been reached, then they are able to activate these early uh, these actions. So the triggers are usually set in a multi-stakeholder uh, engagement uh, process that included the national med agencies, the government agencies, uh, or uh, NGOs, academia, to be able to ensure that people understand the focus, the decisions that they'd like to take uh, within, this, uh, within this focus. And so also the second one is a selection of early actions. So these early actions are selected in advance. So having identified the impact that we would like to address, we looked at which actions, for example, can be implemented to ensure that we minimize or we prevent the breakdown, the outbreak of cholera, which actions can be undertaken to, mean, to ensure that people do not die as a result of, um, of flooding. So the, again, this process that, that there is different criteria for the selection of these actions, but the main point here is that the best actions that are selected are those that have the highest chance of being able to address the identified impact. And again, this is also a consultative uh, process. And then finally, the financing mechanism. So within the Red Cross, there is the, uh, the focus-based financing by the DREF uh, uh, funding that is available to the Red Cross to be able to implement these uh, actions um, uh, when uh, the triggers or the thresholds have been reached. And all this is done within the framework of an early actions protocol that uh, this is a document that indicates uh, when uh, uh, indicates what triggers have been defined, what early actions, the roles and responsibilities of the, uh, of, of the various stakeholders who are engaged. Other organizations such as the Net, uh, Start Network also have their own funding mechanisms that is similar to, to this. The UN also has a similar funding mechanism. There is also the Africa Risk Capacity Funding Mechanism. So there are quite a number of mechanisms that have come up to be able to facilitate taking early actions based on uh, available early warning information. 
And so these are examples of some of the uh, early actions that are, can be taken across different uh, uh, time scales. So for seasonal uh, focus, for example, you can take, uh, uh, you can start uh, disseminating early warning messages. You can start maintaining infrastructure, and then you know at sub seasonal level you can start uh, preparing or uh, uh, preparing communities, for example, to receive cash. If, if one of your early actions is cash, to be able to ensure that people are able to evacuate. And then uh, for the short term uh, days to, to hours, maybe you can start providing uh, 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 cash actually so that people take that um, so that people take that uh, that action that uh, has been identified. What is important to note in this process of selecting early actions is that we match the different thresholds or uh, within the triggers to the early actions. So for example, you would not act you would not um, evacuate people or you wouldn't ask people to evacuate if there is a very low probability of flooding occurring because one this is a very high cost um, this is a very high cost activity but if there is a high probability of let's say you know 60 or 70 or 80 percent depending on context again triggers are context specific for example uh, you may not activate evacuation at 40 percent uh, uh, prob uh, probability in one location but you could uh, uh, activate evacuation in another in another locality so what is important is decision makers need to understand and appreciate the uncertainties that are associated with uh, with focus so that you know they are comfortable with making their with with making their decisions and so processes are undertaken to understand some of these challenges around acting on focus and by the end by the time people agree to make decisions they have accepted the risks that are associated with it and that's why we go through the process of matching the thresholds to the action so that the high uh, 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 when when you have a low probability, you're able to take on what we'd call low regret actions. So, for example, if any flooding does not occur, if you've conducted awareness sessions, you know nothing is really lost. But if you you know if 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 uh, you if you provided uh, uh, cash, for example, and asked people to evacuate, and then flooding may not occur. If people do not understand the probabilities or the risks or uncertainties around for around making decisions around focus, that could be a problem. So there are quite a number of actions that can be taken, and I will also uh, uh, refer you to the Anticipation Hub website, where there is a database of different types of early actions for various hazards that have been undertaken or planned in different countries all over the world. So uh, this uh, talks to uh, understanding a forecast and risk analysis. As I had mentioned, one of the risks of uh, forecast-based financing is people not understanding or appreciating uh, uh, focus and making decisions around them. There is what we call uh, acting in vain. So acting in vain is, you know, a focus indicates flooding is expected to occur in this area. And uh, it, it, it may, uh, for example, cause uh, 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 impacts such as destruction of, uh, of houses or of roads, and then you activate or you implement your early actions, then the flooding does not occur. So for somebody who doesn't understand that, they may think they have wasted their money, but ideally, because of how context specific your communities are, actually the cost of taking this action outweighs not taking action at all. So for people to be comfortable with the concept of acting in vain, they need to understand the forecast. And I'm glad that I have David, I'm not sure if Andrew has also joined, I'm also glad there may be, uh, there are other scientists on the, on the call here who will help us in terms of uh, understanding um, understanding focus. But from a lay person's lang uh, understanding like me, who is not a climate scientist, um, you know, uh, we, we talk about focus skill in terms of, you know, uh, uh, is the focus good enough for you to make, you know, for to you to make a decision as a disaster manager? For example, if 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 uh, it predicted that flooding would happen in a certain uh, uh, community, you know, did it happen? If it didn't, how many times has that prediction been uh, been made and it didn't happen? Or how many times was it made and it and it did happen? So basically, how good enough um, is is that focus in terms of predicting an event uh, and? Uh, um, Yes, how it happened. So maybe I could I could uh, call on David briefly just to talk about a forecast skill briefly before I move on. If if that is uh, helpful, David, or if you'd want me, yes, David, over to you. Yeah. Well, most climate forecasts, in particular, are not specific; they're more general. We can say, for example, that 
take Australia, for example, the forecast is that as climate warms, storms will start missing Australia, moving further south. So that would be a forecast for increasing droughts for Australia. But we would not be able to say ahead of time that this particular summer or week would actually have a drought. That would be more in line with weather forecasting. I think people have gotten into the habit of believing weather forecasts about extreme events like potential hurricane movements with the realization that none, none of the forecasts are perfect. Hurricanes in particular are difficult to really assess very, very far ahead, ahead of time. But with respect to flooding, a number of the events associated with flooding are also very hard to predict in terms of the exact region which it will occur. Most flooding occurs in associated with convective events and thunderstorms. And these are small scale things that as you probably know, can hit one region and a few blocks over, you don't get very much at all. The big forecast events that will affect a large region are better able to be predicted. Uh, but even then we're talking about maybe a week in advance more than anything else. The, the question of when a monsoon will actually occur in India very difficult to actually forecast because these convective events are highly variable in space and time. So I would say with respect in general to weather forecasts, there are some events that people have now recognized have a decent probability of happening. But I think people are also fairly well educated to realize that all forecasts are just that, forecast. They're not guarantees of what will happen. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that. And yes, so for the forecast-based financing, we use forecasts uh, that have a good enough skill to be able to predict in spite of you know, the challenges and all that. So we are saying if we have a forecast, can we try to understand it and use it to make um, decisions? Let the uncertainties around forecast not be our reason for inaction. That for us is our message. You have some pretty much yeah, uh, um, focused information, try and act on it. And then of course, the other is a combination of the risk analysis. So we look at um, the available exposure, vulnerability and historical impact data to identify priority areas on where to intervene with action. So there's a lot of modeling that is done around this, um, these processes. And uh, also we do have, um, we do have a methodology, the FBF methodology that has also been published on uh, on the anticipation guide, uh, on the anticipation hub website that can also help you understand the various methodologies that are used to be able to, um, uh, to utilize this kind of information to help identify when and where early action can be taken. And um, as part of focus-based financing, we use impact-based financing as uh, a decision-making tool to be able to guide uh, stakeholders in terms of where do you take action and when. So impact-based forecasting is a shift from what the weather will do to what, uh, sorry, from what the weather will be to what the weather will do. So for example, um, most cases you will receive, you will see or receive a weather forecast saying, you know, it's, uh, um, Today, it will be sunny, you know, it's going to rain. But as a decision maker, what does this mean to me? I am interested in the impact of this weather, okay? And so that's why, you know, you, you, uh, I like using the, the, uh, the examples, uh, the impact-based forecasting mess, uh, services from the UK Met. You know, it's quite very precise. You're going to have this amount of wind. Uh, it's going to affect this kind of area, and these are the expect these are the expected uh, impacts. Either it will, you know, disrupt your travel plans. It electricity may go off, and therefore do you know do something. So you have the weather information, you have the impact of this weather, you have, you know, the likelihood on where it's going to happen, the probability and what action it's going to take. So that is uh, uh, impact-based forecasting. And we've uh, applied it on most of our projects that we are supporting in uh, in, in Africa, in, uh, in the Americas. And the example you see here, for example, is um, the process that was undertaken in, uh, uh, in Peru when we were designing uh, 
the early actions, uh, sorry, this is Bangladesh, when we were designing the early actions protocol for floods in Bangladesh. So of course, as I'd mentioned, yes, with forecast-based financing, one of the parameters we use is the forecast, so that is the flood forecast. And then under the vulnerability and exposure uh, data sets, here we looked at uh, poverty, as one of the re, uh, as one of the uh, uh, things that makes people vulnerable to uh, impacts of flooding, and then um, uh, houses as one of the the, the most uh, impacts from from flooding. So all this uh, through the modeling uh, processes helps provide um, uh, an idea in terms of where early action is going to be taken. What in the Red Cross we'd call an intervention uh, an intervention area. So this is an area that would, uh, based on the impact-based forecasting methodology, would show you when, where to take early action, when to take early action, and who is most likely to be impacted. So that based on this information, you're able to tailor your actions around, um, around this. And it also helps in terms of planning as well as uh, targeting. So we've done quite a number of um, uh, these um, early actions protocols uh, for floods in Zambia. And currently we're also developing one for drought. We have for Uganda, for, um, for Mali, we have for, uh, for Ethiopia, for Kenya, and also in Americas, we've developed for, per uh, for Peru, for Ecuador, for uh, uh, volcanic ash, interestingly. And then, you know, quite lots. And also as other organizations, the WFP, FAO, are also developing their anticipatory action plans all over the world based on all this. So we do have our early actions protocol guidelines. This clearly shows you how you develop our, how you develop um, um, an early actions protocol. So this is more internal towards the Red Cross, but um, increasingly most um, organizations are also learning from us to try and say, okay, how are you developing your plans? What, you know, what do we include in our plans what how are you developing your triggers what is the criteria for uh, for approving this um this is a, a, a quick snapshot in terms of the benefits of what we have registered so far in some of the countries that uh, we have activated uh, or where we have implemented early action uh, based on uh, the focus or based on the triggers that have been developed so in uh, Bangladesh, as I had mentioned, Bangladesh has an early actions protocol for floods and cyclone. But in 2020 and in 2027, they uh, activated one for floods. And of course, they provided cash uh, for people to be able to uh, uh, move away from the areas that, uh, that they are living and relocate to other, uh, to other areas, as well as meet some other basic needs in the anticipated period of the flooding uh, season. And uh, uh, after that, there was a, an evaluation that was done. And based on that evaluation, of course, it was a comparative study between people who had not received support as part of the FBF, and then those that had received support. And generally, uh, the findings indicated that uh, 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 the people who received support actually uh, were able to use this money, for example, to meet their daily needs. Before what happens is during flooding or when people suffer the impacts of flooding, they actually borrow money to be able to meet their needs. So with this funding that was given in advance, they had less uh, they, they had less stress as a result of you know being able to meet their needs as an uh, uh, um, uh, as being able to meet uh, their needs in in time. And then of course also they were able to continue having access to food. They were able to continue having three meals uh, uh, per. Day day even during the flooding season and yet previously this was not this was not the this was not uh, the situation so there are quite also there are quite also some other benefits that have been uh, uh, recorded from uh, uh, focus based financing initiatives in mongolia for example there's also been some uh, uh, some cost effective analysis that have been done around focus based uh, around focus based financing so for mongolia uh, uh, together with fao uh, support was given to communities that had, because usually when the winters happen, what is called, that's locally called a desude, it is usually the herders who are affected because there is no forage for animals and then animals fall sick and die. And also during the process of moving from uh, one place to another in search of food, uh, you know, they, they quite uh, register a high mortality rate for the animals. So this support was provided and uh, the results indicated that um, uh, households that were short on hay 
were able to provide uh, uh, fodder for their for their animals. And then also uh, the assistance may have contributed to reduce the animal newborn mortality. Of course, uh, if they, they, there were some limitations around around the study, but at least preliminary, this is what uh, uh, this uh, this is what the findings indicate. But even beyond uh, beyond uh, beyond that, also WFC has also conducted some studies around uh, benefits of uh, focused based financing or anticipatory action. So, in other words, it speaks to preparedness or prevention is better than it's better than cure. So some lives are uh, some lives are saved, livelihoods are protected. In conclusion, uh, I would say many risks from climate and weather uh, uh, extremes are expected to increase. The IPCC reports and other reports clearly speak, uh, speak to that. Uh, also, there is increased uh, capacity to be able to predict uh, some of these uh, um, uh, some of these uh, events. Of course, sometimes with the challenges of limited uh, lead times, but we are saying, you know, we have these capacities. There is this information available. Let's act on the information that is. Uh, that is available. And then also disadvantaged and vulnerable communities are the most in need of adaptation solutions. Uh, so we believe that when we support them to be able to anticipate, they are able to address and reduce some of these uh, risks now and in the future. Again, anticipatory action of focus-based financing is not the magic solution, it's just part of the solution. And we can only appreciate the extensive benefits of anticipatory action if this is tied into long-term adaptation. So focus-based financing is just one small component to be able to address the short-term adaptation um, uh, needs. And also our advocacy now is that, you know, we need to do focus-based financing on a bigger scale. We need to be able to cover more hazards, both climate and non-climate non, non um, uh, hazards. We need to be able to uh, increase more financing towards, uh, towards anticipatory action. And again, uh, based on the recent, um, based on the recent uh, uh, resolution uh, by the UN in terms of the, to ensure that everybody is reached uh, by early warning systems uh, in the next five years. So we think if we, you know, if we scale up anticipatory action, we would be able to meet uh, that, that goal and, uh, and milestone. So um, that is uh, what I had for you today. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, over to you, Andrew. And before I introduce Andrew, Irene, thank you for that fantastic lecture. You presented some very practical approaches to address disasters. I'm sure it's very relevant to so many people on the call to, uh, on the Zoom today, because unfortunately, this is something that we read multiple events that are occurring simultaneously reading all of this in the news today. So it's really good to you know, I think people get very frustrated with climate change because, you know, sometimes people feel there's not a lot you can do. But I think listening to lectures like yours really gives us some practical ways where we can really work on the implementation part of uh, dealing with climate change. So really, thank you for that fantastic lecture and also thank you for your wonderful contribution to the book, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. And now it gives me a uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Andrew Krukskevics from IRI Columbia University. When I introduce Andrew and now you can see uh, the introductory slide, I think it's very clear as to why we invited him to moderate today's discussion. And when I would like to tell Andrew that, you know, he has its own really wonderful experiences, uh, you know, working with a range of stakeholders on how to prepare for disasters. So in addition to moderating the discussion, Andrew, we invite you to share your own experiences and insights on using climate science to prepare for disasters. And then we also invite um, any authors from Our Warming Planet to join this discussion. And we already have David, the series editor. And we will have a Q&A session after this discussion. So Andrew, uh, we can have this for about, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, the discussion. And then we can move on to the Q&A session that Jen will moderate. Um, and before Andrew begins, I just want to uh, introduce him. 
Andrew Krukskevich is a senior staff researcher at Columbia University at the Climate School within the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Also within Columbia's Climate School, Andrew is co-director of the Earth Network on Disaster Resilience entitled Sustainable and Resilience Living in an Era of Increasing Disasters Network. He's a faculty lecturer within the Climate School's Climate and Society Graduate Program, as well as Science Advisor at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Andrew's research interests include developing and refining methods for integrating Earth observations into the decision-making, focusing on disaster risk production, public health applications, and humanitarian action, as well as validating and intercomparison of remotely sensed environmental and climatic data sets, focusing on rainfall, temperature, flood detection, land cover, among many other interests. Andrew, we are really looking forward to your discussion and also hearing some of your insights and experiences. Over to you. Thank you so much, Manishka, and thank you so much, Irene. Um, hi, hello, David. We haven't met yet. But thank you very much for the opportunity to moderate the discussion after the wonderful presentation by Irene. Uh, I'm not sure if this was announced earlier, but Irene and I have worked together for some time now, and it's great to be in the same session as a dear colleague and friend. Um, so yes, as Manishka said, I wear a variety of hats, but I'll start off by talking a bit about the importance of the, the climate science element. And myself as a meteorologist first, it's something that I've chose to really prioritize in my career, not just making forecasts as sometimes, uh, sometimes I think back to what got me into meteorology, you know, and it's, I, I'm very much like a, a weather nerd from the very young ages of looking at the, the weather radar and forecasting storms and these things. But as Irene mentioned, that is not enough. You know, that is not enough in order to take action. That is not enough in order to support and, and yeah, make sure that the traditionally underserved populations are prioritized. And this is the amazing thing that the humanitarian sector is transitioning into right now and has been over the past five to 10 years. The Red Cross Climate Center is at the forefront. However, there are many more groups that are following suit and developing alternative methods to forecast-based action or anticipatory action. So it's really an exciting time. I'm not sure if there's any students on the call, but I it's something I, I try to say, like this is an emerging uh, space. And if there are those interested, not only in the science part of the forecast as I was, or let's say the science, the science element of the anticipatory action system, I was interested in the science part, but we also need many people that are at that interface of science policy and practice. So people that are, understanding the policy side that would like to engage more with the science community. And then of course, people on the ground getting things done. Uh, we need all of these, the, these, these skills in order to develop a sustainable and functional anticipatory action system. So just three, a couple other points to highlight that Irene, uh, that Irene discussed. Yeah, going back to the forecast first, we need to have some level of skill within the forecast. And many times, in the places where the Red Cross is working, it's hard. It's hard to assess the degree to which a forecast has skill. We don't have historical data. The spatial resolution of the uh, of the impact um, reports from historical events is not very is not very uh, very it's not sufficient many times. So this is something that we have grappled with. And one point that I would like to to echo is that. The forecast doesn't, doesn't need to be perfect, and it won't be perfect, as David mentioned. That's not the intention of a forecast. Uncertainty is not a bad word. This is something that allows for the forecast to exist in the first place. So this is part of the narrative that uh, we think it is, it's responsible for us engaging in anticipatory action to make sure we talk about that. You know? And in some ways incomplete, if we make statements of forecasts that lead to prioritization of resources, if, if we don't talk about uncertainty. So that's something to highlight. And then the other thing that Irene mentioned, um, and she, she elaborated a bit, I think it was the Bangladesh case. It is, it, it, is, it is incomplete, let's say, to discuss these case studies without talking about what happened. And I really appreciated that in the talk because monitoring and evaluation is an important and many times challenging aspect 
of understanding what worked, what didn't work, why did we prioritize some communities, why did we deprioritize essentially other communities. So it is our responsibility to 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 assess the effectiveness or at least get a sense of what the impact was and if there was a different distribution of impact and thinking about why that was. So those are some key points I would like to highlight before we get into um, before we get into the the Q and A. And I see that we have some questions. So Manishka, I see we have a Q and A um, widget here, but then we also have questions in the chat. I believe, correct? Yes. And Andrew, you can. Um... We can either move to the specific questions later. If you have questions, uh, you know, to direct to Irene about her experiences, we can start with those, and we can then, you know, uh, also move on to the Q and A. We sometimes have um, so typically what we do in these is that we have the lecture and we do the Q and A. But the wonderful thing about having you today is that. Mm -hmm. You have your own experiences. We have Irene and David. So we can, if you have any you know, thoughts on topics that you'd like to discuss, we can start yeah. off uh, five or 10 yeah. minutes focused on that. And sure. then uh, we can move on to the Q&A session. Well, great, thank you, Minishka. So something I was I was thinking would, it would be valuable if, if Irene could elaborate a bit more on, is just that some examples of how the monitoring and evaluation of an activation, how the outputs of that monitoring and evaluation ha have led to improvement of subsequent trigger design or system design. And because it's one thing to do a uh, monitoring and evaluation activity, but then there's another thing to actually take that out, those outputs and influence the way we design other, um, let's say, subsequent triggers for that region or potentially other regions as well. So that's a question I, I, I'm interested in, in hearing more, Irene, about your thoughts on. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Andrew, and again, good to see you uh, ag again. So um, uh, m and &E has been very instrumental in terms of um, contributing towards influencing the agenda on early warning and early action, especially at global level. As uh, you can resonate with it is most, most um, decision makers are hungry for numbers. Most decision makers are hungry for evidence. And so um, usually uh, the, the evaluation that is done at, at uh, um, having activated the early actions is to look at uh, what have we gained or what are the what have been the benefits of us taking actions and so one of the interesting bits around the bangladesh and and uh, mongolia um uh, around bangladesh and mongolia uh case, case studies has been that it has some numbers you know attached attached to it in terms of you know uh, uh we were able to have a certain reduction unfortunately i don't i don't have them off um, off head so that kind of evidence looking at uh how much money for example have we saved by taking action uh in advance compared to emergency response within a similar context so that kind of uh has 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 crept itself into advocacy towards you know scaling this scaling this up from the practice side um Again, I'll, I'll keep picking on Uganda because that was where, mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, ap apologies for the, for the noise in, in, in the background. Yes, yeah, so uh, for, for, for Uganda, just, just give me a minute, please. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, sorry, okay, hold on. So uh, when we piloted anticipatory reaction of focus-based financing in Uganda, there are quite a lot of lessons learned that led to what we currently have. So at the very beginning, you know, we had predefined communities, for example, you know, uh, communities that to be supported had already been predefined. And we had a scenario where actually the focus or the impacts of flooding were felt in a different community and not necessarily in the community that had been predefined. And because mm. of the project restrictions that came along with predefining uh, such communities and spending money in these communities, sadly, um, we were not able to do anticipatory action or early action in the neighboring communities and only ended up doing emergency response. And so one of the lessons learned there was 
predefining or uh, communities is not you know a good idea in itself because at the end of the day you actually exclude people who are more impacted than the other and so that also brought into perspective you know the the utilization of the impact based forecasting and then also letting the focus help decide of course together you know uh, uh, in in um, uh, um, uh, the focus and the risk analysis help guide on where to serve and who should be and who should be served so that is one of the changes the drastic changes that you know came uh, came along from the m and e in terms of uh, the application process then the other bit was around the whole concept around acting in vain and of course i like the uh, the word you mentioned uncertainties are not bad in itself. So we mm -hmm. kind of tested that. So the forecast indicated flooding was going to happen in this community. The Uganda Red Cross uh, uh, provided early actions, they provided uh, 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 water purification tablets, you know, soap and all these things. And actually, after a few uh, uh, days, the focus did not materialize. And so uh, uh, we did again a quick evaluation. So one, uh, communities appreciated the fact that there was a lot of sensitization about limitations of focus. Okay, and then also too, they were happy that actually they still did the actions that they did, although um, uh, even though the flood did not occur. So some of the actions communities did were to dig uh, drainages, you know. So they said either way, you know, it still rained, but it wasn't that much. But we were able to take uh, to take actions. Bottom line, they appreciated the uncertainties or the risks and limitations around focus. And so when we are messaging around focus-based financing, it is a risk that we flag off, you know, so that people are aware and comfortable to take uh, decisions around, um, around that. And then uh, the last one is um, around the documentation. So we've also had scenarios where, you know, we've had conversations around, should we take anticipatory action or should we, you know, it's fair enough to just wait for an emergency response? Like, does an early warning and early action is it ideal for every situation with the limitations of time, with the limitations of uh, of resources? When you look at the situation in Eastern Africa, you know, we, mm. we, we are yes, we, we we keep challenging the notion of uh, early warning for drought. You know, when does that begin? So these are questions that have not yet been uh, answered. We are still grappling. Are grappling with especially for onset uh, disasters but this is a learning process this is yeah. a learning uh, this is a learning journey so we keep improving based on the learnings that that have yeah. happened yeah. thank you Irene yeah it makes me think more about the different types of uncertainty I mean there's yes uncertainty in the forecast but even within the socioeconomic data sets that we use to prioritize different communities those all are also imperfect you know so I don't know if, if David would like to to reflect on that I don't I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on the uncertainty and I'll, your comments before you're talking a bit about the spatial scales maybe if you have any thoughts on how uncertainty plays into the consideration of what is an appropriate spatial scale to make a forecast or these sorts of things yes uh, I'll give as an analogy it's an imperfect analogy but uh, you're at Lamont and uh, some years ago there was a conference at Lamont and they were concerned with for, uh, at, at that point in time, people were talking about the chance of big earthquake in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And they were concerned about how well could we make a forecast? What's the uncertainty associated with the forecast? And then they were also concerned about what would people do if we actually gave them the forecast? Mm -hmm. And in the case of, of an earthquake, which would affect potentially a large region, they thought people would have to get out of there. But in Los Angeles, we know the freeways are already crowded. How could they possibly get out? So there were many discussions about what would be done. Again, the forecast accuracy, when do you, is it 60%, 40%? You know, if it's such a big event, then you might go for a lower probability if, if the, it's a disastrous. Mm -hmm. Somebody who was very uh, knowledgeable about the situation in Los Angeles got up and said, this is all a moot point. Because regardless of whether you gave a forecast or not, people would not go. Mm -hmm. They just would not go. And so under those circumstances, uh, you, you have to now getting back to weather forecasts and the mm. uncertainties associated with them. Mm. I mean, that is a big issue. Uh, Irene, you had on one of your slides, um, a sort of internal dislocation is one of the factors that uh, gets involved when you have these 
these uh, weather or climate related disasters. And um, my, my impression is that this sort of gets a little bit away from your question. My impression is that with that, with that uh, earthquake analogy in mind, that people should be prepared ahead of time to take action. I, I would think that when somebody moves into an area that is flood prone, they should get a book. I know it costs money. They should get a booklet. And the booklet should say, if a flood is forecast, this is what you do. Uh, either you leave and this is a route you should take, or this is a church or a sanctuary you should go to to get out of your house. I think that if you prepare people ahead of time, which, which gives them the impression that there is more likelihood that something bad may happen, I think they're more likely to actually respond to it. So mm -hmm. given uncertainties and forecasts, pre-preparation, uh, warning the people ahead of time, I, I think might actually be a useful aspect to yeah. uh, diminishing problems. Definitely. Yeah. And this is why, I mean, the Red Cross IRI partnership goes back almost 20 years now. And it's one of the first, one of the first concepts that was, that came out of that before my time was just, how do you operationalize the ready, set, go approach? You know, so ready speaks to, I think what you're referring to, David, yeah. right? We need to be ready, but what does ready mean? Ready doesn't mean we evacuate all the time. You know, there is, a, there is a, a level of readiness that we all should increase, but then, but absolutely. Who's going to fund that? And who's going to make sure that the most underserved, the most at-risk people are, are able to access these resources? So these are really good points. Um, another thing we're talking about, how do you know if people are going to take action or not? This reminds me, and I think I'm going to ask Irene to elaborate a bit. This reminds me why the, the, the second F in FBF became the most important, well, maybe not most important, but the financing part because we had a lot of discussions about, great, now we have forecasts tailored to specific actions that Red Cross and humanitarian sector could take, but how are we going to fund them? Is that funding gonna come out of the humanitarian response pot of funds, which is quite large? Or must we create a new fund for anticipatory actions? And I'm gonna ask Irene, if you don't mind, to maybe elaborate a bit more about the, that specific pot that was defined by the Red Cross for just to, have just to increase the ease of dispersing these yeah. funds based on risk, yeah. based on forecasts. Yeah, so yes, I'm happy to, uh, Andrew. So when a disaster happens, you know, impact is seen and felt, it's easier to ask for money. You know, you're talking about, you know, 100 people dead, you're talking about, you know, houses destroyed and all these things compared to, you know, 100 people could die. So one of the limitations of uh, 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 the Red Cross in terms of taking action has been around having money to be able to take action in uh, advance. And so it was a call that, you know, we have the information, you know, we have the human resource capacities, but we need the money. And for us to be effective, to be able to do this, we need the financial resources. So again, with focus-based financing, our um, um, uh, message has been, we have a window of opportunity, you know, and in most cases, that window of opportunity is very short. It could be, you know, days, it could be hours, it could be weeks. And if you look at our uh, organizational institutional processes for uh, processing funding, you know, it's, it's quite bureaucratic, it's laborious, and it defeats the purpose. So in order to ensure that um, uh, uh, humanitarian support is provided on time to the right people, we need funding. And this funding should be ring-fenced to be able to be released once we do have clearly stated triggers, once we do have our actions that have already been identified. And so we are saying we do have the forecast, we do have our actions, we need the money. And if you give us this money, you know, within the framework of early actions protocol, we'll be able to implement these early, these early actions. Also, it's also spoken to the need in terms of uh, um, the, 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 the uneasiness around donors putting money for things that they are not seeing, you know? And so we are saying you cannot achieve, you know, resilience if we are not prepared early in advance. 
So for us to be able to achieve the resilience objective, for us to be able to contribute to various uh, 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 the, the, to, to various um, uh, uh, goals that have been in, in, in uh, that have been uh, in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, there has to be a concept of early warning and early action, and for that to be able to um, uh, to be achieved, we need the money. And money has been financial resources has been one of the biggest gaps from a resource perspective. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that is why we said, okay, we call it focus based financing right now, you know, people are calling it anticipatory action, but bottom line is, we need the money, we need the actions, we have the focus to be able to take, yes. to take actions. Yep. Thank you. So we have, let's see, we have six questions and we have about six minutes left. So can we, <laughs> can, can we do, what can we do one minute a question is our task. Sure. I think we can. All some, right. <laughs> some, of these, some of these might be it's overlapping slash quite short, but let's jump into it. So thank you everyone for your questions. If you have questions, you could still answer them. We will we will we will see them. I'm oh, sorry, you could please ask them and we'll try to get to them. But the first one is from Fabiola Guzman. Can you share a website for the methodologies used? Yes. I mean, Irene, I think we have, at least from the Red Cross uh, perspective, maybe yes. you could share. And also I'm thinking the manual, the forecast-based action yes. manual might be of interest. Um, I'm going to post it here. Just a minute. I'll post that shortly. Okay, great. So that one is um, that one is done. And then Dan Williams, are there specific metrics that should be included in the assessment of forecast-based interventions? Irene, would you like? I mean, I feel like I feel like you've touched on some of these points, but do you want to do you want to dive in a bit deeper here? Um, yes, I will leave uh, the forecast metrics for you, and then just talk about the vulnerability and exposure uh, metrics that right. are taken into. Yes, so one of the um, uh, 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 we we when we are designing forecast based financing, um, we look at what makes people susceptible to the risks that uh, that they face. Again, if we are talking about flooding, you know, and if flooding causes the destruction of houses. Who is at risk of this? Could it be, you know, uh, uh, people living in these uh, in these houses, and what makes them uh, susceptible? So we have to look at the various indicators. Usually, our starting point has been uh, government uh, uh, indicators that are used by government. You know, the, the um, um, vulnerability indicators, literacy indicators, health indicators, and all these things. So you look at these indicators in relation to the impacts that you want to address. And so with that, you can come up with either two or three indicators, uh, vulnerability indicators, and then maybe for exposure, you look at the location. And with this, again, through the, uh, the, through the modeling processes, um, uh, for which I'm not an expert, and uh, this is uh, analyzed and combined with, uh, uh, with the forecast. So each country will have different um, each country will have different indicators that they use. Bottom line, there has to be an integration of vulnerability and exposure analysis into the focus for us to come up with our triggers. Yes. Yeah, and then just a quick reaction on the, the climate slash environmental metrics. Yeah, it varies. I mean, we have, we use satellite-based uh, data for, for some of the triggers, but not all. Um, but yes, this is, um, this is one, of the, one of the important questions to ask. Not only do we have sufficient, or let's say data of sufficient quality um, to monitor recent and current climate, let's say occurrences or experiences, but also how long that, how far back does that go? Because really what we're trying to do is understand the deviation of risk from a baseline level of risk for a certain climate variable. And to establish that baseline level is quite difficult, and sometimes we can't do it. You know, so that's that's it's it's challenging when we have to when we have to deprioritize these anticipatory action approaches just because the forecasts aren't good or because the historical data isn't good enough. You know, it's it, we're we're operating in a very privileged space here as scientists influencing humanitarian decision making, and it's it's one of the hardest things to do is to after analyzing the availability data realize that perhaps this isn't an approach that would work or it's just the uncertainty perhaps is too high or unknown. So thank you for your question. And we could go elaborate more later. Okay, Stephen or Stefan, let's see. What can we say about the relationship between NGOs and state level actors, both in funding and in mobilizing for action? I think this sounds like this sounds like a question we've asked in many uh, meetings, Irene, for many years. So 
Uh, and, and maybe Irene, if you could talk a bit about the unique role of the Red Cross, because before I started working with the Red Cross, I really did not understand the, 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 the role of the Red Cross in many countries. So over to you. Yes, thanks, Andrew. So um, in most countries, um, the Red Cross are auxiliary to the government. And um, most of them or all of them are set up by acts like uh, acts of parliament. So they are there by, uh, by law. And with this, it prepositions the national societies. We call the Red Cross in, in different countries, national societies. So with this, it prepositions the national societies in a situation where they are able to relate uh, with government in terms of advocacy, in terms of influencing, and then also in terms of um, uh, being a big player around uh, disaster, risk, uh, disaster risk management. So broadly speaking, the relationship between humanitarians and governments around resourcing and all this. So for the projects where uh, most countries that have early actions protocols, uh, the governments do not, particularly in Africa, do not have uh, funding or they do not have pots of funding that have already been ring-fenced for uh, anticipatory action or early warning and early actions. Some of them have it in, in their policies, in their laws, but the operationalization is another is another story. So yeah, we don't have yet, at least to the best of my knowledge, a best case scenario where government is putting money, but they are engaged in terms of developing these processes. In most cases, the government comes through uh, during emergency response. Thank you. The next question is from Rosa and it's regarding the, the Superstorm Sandy operations. So I think maybe this is also something to, to to note that the Red Cross Climate Center is, is not, the American Red Cross was in charge of that response. So it's, it is, let's say, I don't think it's necessarily a, appropriate for us to comment on that. I also don't know the details, but Irene, do you have an answer? Maybe it's a moment just to, to say again about what the Climate Center is as a reference center. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, thank you. So I'm not uh, familiar with the details of the question, but if it pertains to the American Red Cross, uh, yes, it would be fair for them to speak for themselves, but then also, yeah, sandy storms and all that. I don't think we had a very strong uh, engagement in that. So uh, the Climate Center is a reference center for the Red Cross and Red Cross move, uh, movement and its partners. And we support um, on uh, addressing the impacts of extreme and climate weather events that affect the most vulnerable. We do this through the intersection of policy, practice, and science. So we contribute towards uh, providing technical support. We are not necessarily an implementing agency, but we are there as a sounding board around climate risk management. Thank you. So I believe we've reached we're at time for the Q&A. Um, over to you, Manishka. Thank you, Andrew, so much for moderating the discussion and for diving into the Q&A. Uh, clearly, we had a lot of audience engaged, so we couldn't get to all the questions, uh, even though we had a one and a half hour session. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's great to see so much interest from the audience and we'll try to get to some of those even as we wrap up. Uh, Irene, Andrew, David, if you can type up some answers, that will be wonderful. So I'll uh, let Jen share her screen so we can begin the wrap up. But I just wanted to um, thank the audience for participating. Irene, thank you for that wonderful, very practical uh, and informative um lecture, it was really great. And Andrew, that was a really great uh, addition to our lecture today to have this session moderated by you and for really appreciate you sharing all your insights and experiences as well. David, as always, uh, thank you for being part of this and all the other webinars we've had from the beginning and Jen, thank you for your support. Uh, and we can move on to the next couple of slides. I have shared this webinar recording link in the chat so you can um, catch up on any past recordings uh, by using this link and on to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned in the chat and previously, as all good things, this webinar series, which began in February with the book launch will come to an end. Uh, we encourage you to click on the registration link, which I've shared and we'll share it again to sign up for these last three lectures. And for the last lecture, we will send an announcement a few weeks ahead. We have this wonderful final lecture, which is also the final lecture in the book, Adaptation to Climate uh, 
change. It's a nice wrap up lecture, but we will, we will invite all the authors from the book. We'll have some great panel discussions. So we'll send an announcement. So, but you can register for it now. So please do. And then as you can see, we've completed a lot of the lectures. So you can catch up and watch them on the CC Run website. So let me just uh, once again, just to remind everyone, add those links to the chat. It's really great to have this webinar unintentionally fall during climate week. I think it makes it extra special. Thank you. Even though we had so many sessions by so many groups this week, it's so wonderful to have a great uh, turn out today. The objective of the book and webinar series is to reach students, teachers, professionals, and all interested people across the world, especially in regions with limited resources. This is why we've recorded them. This is why they'll always be there for people to use it as and when needed. Please spread the word so that we can reach as many people as possible. We hope that these resources will help to advance climate change education across the world. We thank everyone for their participation. Thank you, Irene, Andrew, David, and Jenna as well. We look forward to your participation again in two weeks. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye Marisha. everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone.